Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by, for more than 110 years, NJBIA has been focused on the advancement and success of our members. We're the voice representing all industries, working together to help build a more prosperous New Jersey through advocacy, support, networking, and benefits. NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place PATH train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger and IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Visit IBEW102.org. This week on NJ Business Beat, it's not over yet. Governor Murphy extends the public emergency, but also lifts a major mandate at the same time. Plus, is New Jersey no longer the champ? We analyze what Super Bowl betting will look like now that New York has legalized online bets. And we put the state of Black-owned business in focus, highlighting the progress made for business owners, the challenges they face gaining financial support, and how owners are empowering each other. That's straight ahead on NJ Business Beat. This is NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. Hello, I'm Rhonda Schapther. Thanks for joining us on NJ Business Beat. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel to get alerted when we post new episodes and clips. Governor Murphy this week announcing that the mask mandate in New Jersey schools will be lifted on March 7th, while also extending the statewide public health emergency for another 30 days. That extension is not sitting well with some Republican lawmakers who have introduced a bill that would curtail the governor's emergency powers. They want the legislature to have more say. Now, in lifting the mask mandate, Murphy joins several other governors who have decided masks are no longer needed in schools as COVID numbers continue to decline. But Governor Murphy says school districts can choose to keep a mask requirement or return to it should COVID cases spike again. We are not removing the ability of individual district leaders to maintain and enforce such a policy within their schools or any private child care provider from maintaining such a policy within their business should community conditions require. Likewise, any student, educator, or staff member, or visitor who chooses to continue masking up while indoors may freely do so. The state this week throwing out a lifeline to homeowners facing financial difficulties due to the pandemic. Officials launched the Emergency Rescue Mortgage Assistance Program, which will give eligible homeowners up to $35,000 to help cover delinquent mortgage payments. The money can also be used to pay other housing-related costs, such as late property taxes. Applications are now being accepted for the program. In order to apply, a homeowner must have had a significant reduction in their income or loss of income due to COVID-19. No doubt you've been gathering up your W-2s, 1099s, 1098s. I could go on to get ready for tax season. The IRS is urging people to file early and electronically, saying they're facing a backlog already in processing federal tax returns. But NJ Spotlight budget and finance writer John Reitmeyer tells us the state isn't having any issues and any tax refund you are owed from the state should not be delayed. The State Department of Treasury says it's ready and has actually already started processing tax returns for the 2021 tax year, so in advance of, you know, the upcoming deadline in April. And, you know, they're still on course to start sending out refunds to taxpayers by the first week of March, which is customary for the Department of Treasury here in New Jersey. If you've received a letter from the state saying you have to pay back some of the unemployment benefits you received during the pandemic, don't take any action just yet. 
This week, the U.S. Labor Department issued new guidance that forgives overpayments in certain circumstances. State Labor Commissioner Robert Asaro Angelo called this great news for New Jerseyans who received benefits thinking they were entitled to them only to find out that federal guidance had changed and they were not eligible. Now, you'll remember during the pandemic how many people said the whole unemployment process was very confusing. Under this new guidance, workers do not have to repay their benefits if they wrongly answered certain certification questions or were wrongly paid higher weekly amounts based on miscalculations by the state. The state Labor Department says it will notify claimants who are eligible for waivers of overpayment. Up to 250,000 residents may have been overpaid. Super Bowl weekend is here and the big game is big business. It's typically a good day for pizza shops and sports bars. And of course, it is the premier event for the sports betting industry. The American Gaming Association says a record 31.4 million Americans plan to bet on the Super Bowl, a 35 percent increase from last year's game. The growing legalization of sports betting across the country is fueling the jump. What we're seeing shape up now is a battle for business between sports books in New Jersey and in New York, where betting was recently legalized. Lou Monaco follows sports betting for EmpireStakes.com. It's going to be a major impact, but New Jersey's held their own. You know, when, in the first couple of weeks that New York has started legalized sports betting, uh, New Jersey actually gained some customers both on the mobile end and also uh uh, appearances at the retail sports books, for instance, the Meadowlands, Freehold Raceway, some of the casinos down in Atlantic City. When it comes to work, some of us think about leaving the nine to five life behind and becoming an entrepreneur. But how do you do that exactly? Well, Rowan University has launched a new school for students interested in entrepreneurship skills. Rowan says its School of Innovation and Entrepreneurship within the College of Business is the first of its kind in New Jersey and one of just a few university-based schools in the U.S. We found out more from Dr. Sue Lerman, who is Dean of Rowan's Rohr College of Business. Dean, the business school now has a school of innovation and entrepreneurship. How was the school born and why is it important for the business school to offer um, an addition at this time? We have in the College of Business been focused on entrepreneurship for over 15 years, but in the last five years, we have really amped up our focus uh, on entrepreneurship across the campus, which means we're not just interested in training entrepreneurs, which we are, uh, but we're interested and think it's really critical for all students uh, to think like an entrepreneur, whether they ultimately start a business or not, uh, so that they're entrepreneurs in the companies that they work for. Um, they're entrepreneurs in all aspects of their lives. And so that has been our focus uh, across the campus for the last five years. And this was just the culmination. Uh, we've had entrepreneurship programs. We've had curricular programs in entrepreneurship. We have a center for innovation and entrepreneurship, but this was just the opportunity to take it to the next level. So I love something you just said, think like an entrepreneur. What does that mean and how do you educate students to do that? So um, the attributes that an entrepreneur needs to be successful in a new venture are things like being innovative, creative, taking the initiative, being persistent, being gritty. And those are the kinds of attributes that I know when I hire someone, I'm looking for those attributes. And I think that employers across the spectrum are looking for those attributes as well. And so there are ways that you can actually engage students in becoming more innovative. Uh, in becoming more gritty, uh, in helping them to learn the importance and techniques um, for taking the initiative. What have some of your business contacts in the community told you over the years while you've had this focus on innovation and entrepreneurship that, that helped perhaps make you think the timing was right for this school? Well, um, across the country, some very select schools that we look to as being uh, aspirants of ours have taken this step 
it's still uh, a unique small group that are, are seeing this as an important way to elevate entrepreneurship. And we wanted to be uh, we wanted to be a leader of the crowd, not a follower of the crowd. So you're just getting started. How many students are enrolled in the school and what are your hopes in terms of growing enrollment? As we have over the last five years really ramped up, our enrollments have likewise really ramped up. We're really particularly interested um, in minors, students who minor in entrepreneurship. Uh, we know a lot of students, you know, they may be an engineering major, they may be an art major. They're not going to be able to do a full major degree program in entrepreneurship, but they can do five or six courses in entrepreneurship and our growth in the minor has increased over 400% just in the past couple of years. And it really is on a trajectory to go much higher. And along the way, we also have more majors. Well, I'm so happy we got caught up to hear about what's happening at Rowan and I wanna thank you for your time. Oh, thank you so much, really a pleasure. Earlier this month, the head of the Small Business Administration, Isabella Guzman, marked Black History Month. She noted that Black business owners and entrepreneurs have long faced historic inequities and barriers to capital and resources needed to start and grow their businesses. And she said the SBA is committed to change that. She stated that these challenges worsened during the pandemic, but at the same time noted the entrepreneurial spirit continues to thrive in the Black community and Black businesses are helping to revive our economy and put us back on track. This week, we're putting the state of Black-owned businesses in focus. Black residents make up more than 12% of New Jersey's population. And while the state has more than 937,000 small businesses, only about 82,000 businesses, or 8.7%, are Black-owned. Minority business owners were at a disadvantage when it came to getting help during the pandemic. You'll recall the government was approving PPP loans to help keep businesses afloat. 70% of white business owners who applied received their full loan request, compared to just 43% of Black business owners. Put another way, only 4% of white business owners were denied a PPP loan, compared to 20% of Black business owners. One New Jersey leader fighting for Black business owners is John Harmon. He is the founder and president of the African American Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey. We talked about the economic challenges facing Black residents in the state and Harmon's efforts to level the playing field for businesses owned by Black residents. John, you are part of a national effort really to get more focus on looking at corporate boards and bringing on more people of color. How is that progressing? That is progressing relatively well. You know, we're working in partnership with two great organizations here in New Jersey. The New Jersey State, uh, New Jersey Chamber of Commerce led by Tom Bracken. We're making tremendous progress leveraging their board uh, with engagement in, for those opportunities, board seats, supplier diversity, career opportunities and community investment. Similarly, we're working with uh, Michelle Sakurka in New Jersey business and industry to do the same. So my hope is I'm very optimistic about what this is gonna look like another year or so from now. So we have to be encouraged at this moment. I'm glad that there are a lot of efforts that you feel encouraged about. I'm gonna ask you about another one that has been challenging as well for black owned businesses and that is access to capital. Um, there have been some state programs that seem to target assistance for Black-owned businesses, but are we seeing in the private sector a more willingness in terms of financing startups and providing lines of credit for existing businesses? So the short answer is yes. I mean, we're working real closely with Tim Sullivan and his team at the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. They've been great partners. But um, Rhonda, several months back, we had, through our engagement with the New Jersey Bankers Association, we've added at least 25 financial services institutions to our organization. So we have direct access to those organizations and they're willing, there is a willingness to get opportunities done for those who are acquiring, uh, seeking financing, lines of credit, mortgages, et cetera. But in addition to that, we work with New Jersey Community Capital. Um, 
we have a, a loan fund, if you will, that we've gotten uh, institutions like TD Bank, Pascal Sykes Foundation, Wells Fargo, and others, we put in about $7 million to help the smaller loans. The public sector still is lagging behind. State government, it's about 1% on a good day of public contracts to black businesses in the state, and that's abysmal. Uh, we have one of the most diverse states in America. A net worth for blacks is $5,900 versus $315,000. I also want to ask you about another statistic that I look at every month. Uh, it's a national statistic, but it certainly doesn't move too much. And that is the Black unemployment rate, which remains much, much higher than the unemployment rate for whites. What's it going to take for that to be equalized? Well, I mean, we have the highest poverty, highest unemployment in New Jersey. So, Ron, you ask a very good question. So, again, the private sector are trying to hire as many people as possible. But in New Jersey, the policy does not align with the rhetoric. What I mean by that, that if, if the state of New Jersey, like New York, had commissioned its disparity study and completed it, you know, four years ago, um, there would have been a lot of incentives to hire more Blacks across the state, not only in jobs and contracts. So if you're contracting with Black businesses, they're gonna be hiring black people. If you contract with Hispanic businesses, they're gonna be hiring more Hispanics. And if you incentivize in the public sector through mainstream New Jersey, they're gonna find a way to hire blacks and others. So the policy in New Jersey is not equitable to ensure that black people get a, an appreciable share of the state's priority, I mean, prosperity. First of all, thank you so much for your time and I applaud your efforts to try to facilitate change in New Jersey. Thank you, John. Thank you, I appreciate it. Recently, the investment bank Goldman Sachs announced a new round of investments in its initiative known as One Million Black Women. Launched last year, that program is a commitment to spend more than $10 billion over the next decade to advance economic opportunity and racial equity. New Jersey businesswoman Aisha Taylor Issa is playing a role in this initiative. Aisha is founder and CEO of the Sistas in Business Expo, which bills itself as the country's only multi-city small business expo created specifically to celebrate and empower entrepreneurial women of color. Aisha, the Goldman Sachs One Million Black Woman Initiative is something that you have gotten involved in. Tell me what you're doing with it. We are so excited to be one of the inaugural partners of the One Million Black Women Initiative. Uh, in that partnership, we have helped to both amplify the mission as well as uh, receive uh, feedback from our community of Black women entrepreneur entrepreneurs uh, by hosting several listening sessions uh, across the country, both in person and vir virtually, which allowed us to gain information on what women of color entrepreneurs needed, take that back to Goldman Sachs so they could better formulate uh, the program and develop uh, services. You've spoken with thousands of women. This initiative has spoken to thousands of women. What are you hearing from these entrepreneurs? What do they need right now? What is still lacking? Uh, support. Uh, women of color entrepreneurs need support and they need that by way of access uh, to capital resources to help them learn, grow and scale, uh, training uh, to give them the skills and tools that they need to successfully start, grow and scale their businesses. How would you describe the progress in getting that support? Um, we've spoken in the past and you know, it's about a year ago. So are we closer to reaching some of these goals? And if not, why? Absolutely. Uh, Goldman has been phenomenal in not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. And they are actually putting uh, programs and opportunities in place uh, that provide resource and access to uh, women of color, both entrepreneurs and in other segments. And so I'm really, really proud that they've already announced their initial round of funding um, and 
most recently uh, at the top of this year announced a second set um, of programs and funding that were being made available to organizations uh, and communities around this country. And so we are getting closer. Uh, we have a long way to go, um, but Goldman is leading the path in providing these types of opportunities that are so critical uh, for Black women to succeed and excel in their various, various areas of expertise. One thing we've seen really through the pandemic is women quitting their jobs in very large numbers. Are you hearing stories anecdotally or seeing yourself that some women of color are using leaving the workforce as an opportunity to pursue entrepreneurship? Throughout the course of the pandemic, the number of businesses has um, quadrupled. We are seeing more and more small businesses started uh, because women realize the need to have flexibility, to be able to be home with their children or families, to be able to control their destinies and leave a legacy uh, for their communities and their families. So it sounds like even though there's some progress being made, there are still some hurdles, but those hurdles aren't really discouraging women of color. You know, it's hard to discourage a woman of color. Uh, we have already overcome uh, so much um, throughout our history uh, and even in this present day. And so while we are faced with many challenges, we always find a way to turn those challenges into opportunities, to find a way to make it happen. Uh, and it's always great when we don't have to do that alone, when we have the support of organizations like Goldman who are willing to take that journey with us. And you certainly are helping a lot of women take those steps. So Aisha, thank you so much for spending time with me. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Earlier in the program, we mentioned how the SBA administrator sees the entrepreneurial spirit thriving in the Black community. That brings us to Michelle Brown, the president of One Stop Grocery Supply in North Bergen. She shared her story of making the jump from an employee to owner and offered advice to others who want to run their own company. Michelle, uh, welcome to the program. Really nice to see you. Thank you. Good morning, Rhonda. Tell me about your experience. What made you decide to start One Stop Grocery Supply and how did you obtain the capital for your business? Well, actually, I didn't start the business. I purchased the business. I worked for the company for over 10 years and uh, I left for a few years to pursue some other endeavors and be a more involved parent. And uh, out of the blue, I hadn't heard from the previous owner for a number of years. I got a phone call from him uh, stating that the business wasn't doing very well. And he'd like to know if I was interested in coming back. And um, we talked, we negotiated. And as a condition for my return, he agreed to sell me the business when he retired. So it probably, since you had a unique situation there, was not so much of a challenge in terms of securing capital to start, but what about once you started to get into the business and you needed to purchase things? Did you feel that you faced any additional obstacles as an African-American woman? Things were going, around, uh, going very well until the pandemic hit. And that of course gave me a new set of challenges and I did have to um, apply for some capital. I don't think that I was at a disadvantage as an African-American woman. Um, my business is a high value business. My customers come to me because I provide high value to them. Uh, the items that I sell are not unique. I don't produce them. I don't manufacture them. So they come to me because of the value they get from my company. And um, being an African-American woman hasn't been a, an issue or part of the equation. So I'm so intrigued uh, when you were talking about how the pandemic impacted you. Let's dig into that a little bit more. And also, you must have your finger on the pulse of these supply chain disruptions we're having. So um, talk to me about some of the difficulties over the last couple of years and where we are now with some of that. I've been in this industry for over 25 years, and the last couple of years have been very, very challenging. Um, First of all, prices are fluctuating on a weekly basis. There were prices, uh, paper products where, um, the paper products uh, in particular, the prices stayed the same for years. Every now and then you'd have a nominal increase and now the prices change on a weekly basis. Uh, one of my largest suppliers, same thing, same price for about 15 years. Within the last two years, we've had several increases from them. What advice do you have, especially for anyone who is uh, perhaps a woman of color or any other minority group for trying to start a business 
somebody who might not have um, the kind of connections that other business leaders do? The best advice I can give is to get your ducks in a row. Uh, some things are very obvious. Um, make sure your credit is, you know, have good credit. Uh, lower your debt, get your debt as low as possible. Lower your personal expenses, save some money. Uh, those things, I think any business that you start, whether you're selling a service or product are, you know, things you want to keep in mind. The second thing uh, I think is really important to do is to get together a team. Before you begin working on the business, make sure you have a good accountant and a good attorney. Those people are essential as you uh, begin or grow a business. Michelle, it's been great speaking with you and learning about your journey. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rhonda. Have a great day. And that wraps up our show for this week. Join us next week where we take a closer look into sky high inflation and how that's impacting residents in New Jersey. Thank you for watching NJ Business Beat. I'm Rhonda Schaffler. You enjoy your weekend. Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by, for more than 110 years, NJBIA has been focused on the advancement and success of our members. We're the voice representing all industries, working together to help build a more prosperous New Jersey through advocacy, support, networking, and benefits. NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place PATH train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger and IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Visit IBEW102.org.